Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Simon Anthony Abu Fidel with the Screen Actors Guild Foundation Life Raft Program. You say my name and title three times, you'll be vocally warmed up for any pilot season audition. <laughs> I want to give a quick shout out to uh, Trish Avery in, in Dallas, Texas for having a branch party out there. Welcome Dallas, Texas and Trish and all our regional members. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mom. Thank you. Uh, I want to give a big thanks to the SAG Foundation, the Screen Actors Guild, and Breakdown Services Virtual Channel Network for tonight's event and getting the word out. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. And for the support in this partnership event with Virtual Channel Network and the Screen Actors Guild Foundation. The, uh, for those who don't know, the Virtual Channel Network is the network for the entertainment industry, created by the entertainment industry. It's presented by Breakdown Services. VCN's goal is to provide programming of interest to actors, casting, talent representatives, directors, producers, and studio and network executives. Check it out at virtualchannelnetwork.com. Uh, we have a raffle tonight for our online viewers as well as our in-house audience. We have three uh, casting director uh, directories tonight, three for the online audience and three for the in-house audience. So we'll be randomly selecting three questions from online and three from in-house for those winners. So put your names on your questions and tell us what city you're from. Uh, one we do request feedback forms tonight. There's a survey online. Please do take that survey. It lets us know what's working for our regional members and what isn't. And uh, do be candid. It's anonymous. And we are taking questions by question cards. So do email them in or Twitter them in online. Use your question cards in-house. I found as I, we were putting this event together with uh, Seth over at uh, Virtual Channel Network that I was drawing a lot from um, uh, a book, An Agent Tells All by Tony Martinez. So I did want to give him uh, proper credit and thank him for that work. Um, we also have a new live stream that's coming up this Sunday that I wanted to alert our regional branch members to. The Social Network will be live streaming a Q&A with the producer Scott Rudin and the casting director Larray Mayfield this Sunday at 2 o'clock Pacific time, January 23rd. So tune in same place for that event. And also want to encourage uh, regional branch members, we had uh, uh, thousands of you watch uh, last week's program, uh, to vote for the SAG Awards. Your ballots are due Friday, January 28th by noon Pacific time. And you can go to www.sagawards.org forward slash voting for more information. Um, also, we have a casting director's in-house tonight. Uh, we do ask that those online and in-house, don't inundate them, please, with headshot mailings and postcards and emails and phone calls after tonight's event. It kind of bogs down their system. So please do, they donated their time tonight. Uh, do ask your questions this evening. And uh, we're going to let them get home to their family and friends since they've donated their time. And we do have CD boxes for those in-house, so they'll be taking those with them. And last, um, April Webster was, uh, next to last, April Webster was caught in a last minute casting emergency, so we do have wonderful Jason Wood taking her place. Um, and last disclaimer, the anything we say tonight uh, doesn't necessarily mean an endorsement on the part of the Screen Actors Guild Foundation, the Screen Actors Guild, or the Virtual Channel Network. Anything you hear, seek your own counsel, make up your own decision, and enjoy yourselves most of all. So having said that, please do welcome our moderator extraordinaire tonight, Seth Colton from the Breakdown Services Virtual Channel Network. Thank you, Seth, and your team for all the work. Hey, everyone. Hey, guys at home. Thank you so much for having me. I know so many of you look very familiar because I, Sam Dobbins, I've seen you guys put your headshots through Actors Access, and I'm so grateful uh, that the SAG Foundation has allowed us to partner for these events. Uh, we really do believe in what the foundation is doing. We love working with them. We love working with Simon Anthony Abu Fidel. We think that he sort of uh, embodies some of the things the Virtual Channel Network embodies, which is getting real information to real actors and real people in the entertainment industry. Now, before I bring out some of our amazing panelists, I want to acknowledge, besides having some fantastic actors and uh, the audience here tonight and at home, we have some great uh, talent reps, some agents and managers who are sort of sprinkled and hidden in the audience. Uh, so they also wanted to come out and show their love and support for the foundation and talk a little bit more about pilot season. So uh, thank you guys all for coming. Oh, you're gonna, you're gonna clap or what? <laughs> thank you. Okay, our first guest, I'm very, very, very proud to uh, introduce. She's a good friend. She is the president of the Casting Society of America. She's a former network television executive and she just cast a little movie called The Green Lantern. Please welcome Pam Dixon. Pam. Um. 
Our next guest is another fantastic casting director who casts both television and film. His name is John Papsidera, and he has cast, among other things, he did the pilot of No Ordinary Family and another little film called The Dark Knight Rises. John, please come out. John is awesome. Okay, now our first um, talent rep of the evening. She's a manager. She is also a good friend, a very fun lady. Uh, her, she put three, or her company put three of the leads in the show Glee, and they also put Taylor Lautner in the movie Twilight. Uh, please give a warm welcome for Mara Santino from Luba Rockland Entertainment. And tonight, for the first time, I've met uh, this agent who's about to come out, but I've heard about her uh, through the years, my work in casting. Um, she is a partner and a talent agent at SDB, which is one of the top talent agencies here in Los Angeles. And their clients include Chris Pine and James Cromwell, among others. Please give a warm welcome to Susie Schwartz. And I was so thrilled to hear that uh, Jason Woods decided to join the panel at the last minute. Uh, he's such a great guy, a fantastic casting director. He's gonna add a lot. Um, he also casts television and film. And besides many other things, two of the pilots they worked on is our single ladies and Samantha Who. Jason, please come out. Okay, this is where it gets a little rough because I am going to ask each of these wonderful panelists just to tell you a little something about themselves or sing a song, either one. <laughs> Starting with you. Okay, I'm definitely not singing a song because I can't carry a tune, so that would be a disaster. Um, um, I graduated from USC um, in education. I wanted to be a lawyer and I decided to go to business school, so I went to business school for a year and I got recruited by CBS Television to become a network executive out of business school. I started at CBS, I worked for the head of casting, and then I went to ABC and became head of casting. And then I went from ABC to Paramount because my boss, Michael Eisner, left ABC and I became a production vice president and kind of left casting for about, I guess about eight years. And then I was married, I had my first child, and when I had my second child, I said I cannot be a development movie executive anymore, I need to have my life back. So I went back into casting, and at that point, most of the people I knew were movie people. So the first job I ever got was from someone I'd worked as a development executive with. And I've been casting movies on my own for, I guess, about 15, 16 years. Um, that's my story. Yeah. John. Hi, I'm John Papsidera. Um, uh, that was so succinct. That was very nicely done, Pam. Um, uh, and I don't know where you got my credits approved from, Seth, but we'll talk about Sorry. that. Um, anyway, uh, I'm an um, independent casting director. Uh, I have had my own company for mm, 15, 16 years, something like that. I don't know why I'm looking at you, Pam. And, um, I'll verify that. <laughs> And uh, the first feature, I, I, my background was as an actor. I uh, went to graduate school, studied as an actor, NYU and Circle in the Square in New York, and um, got into casting in Los Angeles after another career, and, um, and worked with a variety, started at the Mark Taper Forum, uh, worked in theater for the first couple of years, then worked with uh, a lot of independent casting directors, uh, ultimately started my own company, my first feature I did by myself actually was Austin Powers, uh, the original Austin Powers. And um, I do Chris Nolan's films and Dark Knight Rises is the current one. Inception was my movie and, uh, um, and uh, I, that brings us up to present, I guess. I'll leave it at that. But did, did I mess up on your credits? No, no, no. I just didn't approve the No Ordinary Family at oh, all. Oh, my but, bad. But, you know, yes. yes. Okay. okay, good. Yeah. Sorry, just never. <laughs> Hey everyone, my name is Mara Santino. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Go Steelers! I hope there are no Jet fans in the house. 
Um, I went to Point Park College and moved out to LA to be an actress. And within two months, I realized I need a job to pay the rent. And my good friend Lisa Pantone said, oh, I'll, JHR at the time, which is now KSR, formerly KSA, um, she said they're looking for a receptionist. And I went in and met with the owners, and they hired me. Two weeks later, I was an assistant, and I worked my way up. I was a commercial agent, print agent, and um, eventually I became a TV and film agent because that's where my heart was. I developed a lot of young actors uh, who are movie stars now. And about three and a half years ago, I joined a company called Luber Rockland Entertainment because I got tired of developing my clients for CAA, ICM, and William Morris. <laughs> so I uh, joined the other side, management, and I've been there three and a half years at Luber Rockland. Hi, um, I'm Susie Schwartz. Um, I've been a talent agent for 35 years. Um, uh, our company, SDB, is about 17 years old. Um, my partner, Roe Diamond, and I have worked together for 35 years. <laughs> <laughs> I know, believe that or not. And um, I started, um, I went to Tulane Drama School. I started um, in acting, moved into production, came out here, worked on some films got a job as an assistant in an agency, stayed at that agency for 20 years, became an agent, um, like a year after I started there. And the rest is kind of history. We, I represent about 150 clients. Many of them are on television series, film, and I cover a lot of theater for our, or all the theater for our office. That's me. And I'm not April Webster. <laughs> uh, Jason Wood, I grew up in Georgia. Did an internship in high school with a casting director named Shay Griffin and went into casting and actually met Pam years ago when she was doing a movie there. And um, after college, decided I didn't want to sell medical sales supplies or work in an office. So I moved to LA and went to work with a casting director who I'd also met in Atlanta. And then was lucky to work with Randy Stone, who I think all of you know, who's a fantastic casting director at 20th Century Fox as a casting executive there. And then went independent and did Monk and some other pilots and Movies of the Week, and then partnered about five years ago with Tammy Billick, who has done a lot of comedy casting. And now we consult for Lifetime, overseeing their pilots and movies, and also do other movies. I do a bunch of MTV movies, like My Super Psycho, Sweet 16, 1, 2. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and we're also doing a VH1's first scripted series, uh, Single Ladies, which we'll shoot in Atlanta, which Queen Latifah is exec producing and will appear in. So very soon we're going to move on to the moderated portion of this evening, but before we do, my co-producer Otto Wolfhoek and I wanted to make sure we acknowledge the superstars that are here, which are you actors in the room and you actors at home. It takes so much courage and heart and belief in yourself to stick through this career as you are doing. And um, more impressively on top of that, you are here willing to learn uh, which says a lot about who you are. So I was hoping you guys maybe could give them a round of applause the way they gave it to you. <laughs> you deserve it. Thank you. Okay, so as we begin, we had a lot of emails coming into the office, um, and a lot of them were from people who were sort of just getting started in the business. So I want to make sure we include them in this conversation. So having said that, Ms. Dixon, I would like to know if you could just define for me very briefly what exactly a pilot is. A pilot is basically a presentation of what's to come. It's a presentation of who the regulars would be, who, what the story would be about, if it's a continuing story, what will happen to the lives of these characters. And that's to give the networks a view of what the series could be. 
Um, some pilots end up airing, and there are some pilots that never go to air. But it's really a presentation made to the networks of what's to come and what the series would be about. And John, do you want to add something to that? No, I was impressed with that, Pam. I, <laughs> I, was, I would not have said that. But yes, that was perfect. I liked it. That was great. So John, since you have the mic close to your face, thank yeah. you. Yeah. I would like to ask you, I, I know yeah. that pilots typically are a bit more of a, a rush to cast than episodic when it goes to series. Can you tell me how long you typically normally have to cast that pilot? Um, I think usually, I mean, it depends. You know, I, I think um, uh, usually it's about eight weeks, maybe six weeks, six, eight weeks, somewhere in there to, uh, to cast a pilot completely. Um, I think the, you know, the toughest thing about it, one of the toughest things, is that you're competing, you know, in the marketplace with every other pilot. And, um, you know, those numbers, I mean, now they're down, but, and Pam can speak more to this, but, you know, there used to be over 100 pilots, I think, in pilot season. And, you know, now you're still competing against 60, 70 pilots um, for the same talent pool. So, you know, that's, that's the added pressure to the, the to time constraints. Makes sense. Um, Jason, can you tell us why you think there's a, a designated pilot season? I and mean, why do we have a pilot season? Pam? No. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah what, what I would answer yeah. to that well, is I, I mean, think originally I think originally season. it evolved from advertising. There were certain times of the year where advertisers in the and usually towards the first six months of the year where they wanted to be able to invest money and it, within their budgets they had the money. So what happened is it became the first six months of the year. And some of the pilots now are not in that period of time, especially for, you know, like Showtime and HBO and TNT, and even Nickelodeon is sometimes doing pilots outside of that time frame. But originally it was designed as a pilot season because advertisers came to see all of the pilots, and it was the buying period and the selling period. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I would like to ask the talent reps, since we are on the just getting started portion of pilot season, how does pilot season affect your daily routine? And if it was not an intelligent question, just sort of pretend and say whatever you want. When I first started um, repping actors for TV and film, there was a time when the studios, I don't hear so much about it anymore. They used to have development deals for actors and holding deals where they pay an actor like sometimes a lot of money sometimes a little money so they're um, exclusive to the network and most of the time for pilot season the studio networks will have um, a hit list of actors, and you probably know more about that than me, but th they'll call my actors and check their availability um, and sometimes they'll make offers, sometimes they'll just go straight to the network test. And you have to remember, if you're an up-and-coming actor, that those actors obviously get first choice for those pilots. And while they're doing deals, and correct me if I'm wrong, they do see other actors. And your question, how does pilot season affect us? Well, I'm sometimes at work till 11, 12 o'clock at night uh, submitting because we're dealing with other issues during the day. And so many pilots come out during the day and we're fielding calls from actors saying, when am I going to get an audition? Or trying to um, juggle times for actors who have four or five auditions a day. So it is a really crazy time during pilot season. That, that just <laughs> says it all. It really does. <laughs> okay, Susie, a follow-up to that is, is this typically the time of year that you're looking to bring on new talent, or is this the time of year that you're working way too hard for the talent you have? Yeah, it used to be that in pilot season, it was a little more open as far as, far as new actors getting in. Um, and it's gotten harder and harder for new talent to get in on pilots. So no, it's not the time. I would say the time that we would be looking for new talent is probably more um, once pilot season's over, April, May. Um, and the development of actors has become, it used to be something that we did a lot and we enjoyed doing. It's become so difficult. So 
um, we've taken fewer and fewer new people. Um, that's not to say we don't, but right. Chris Pine came to us through a casting director. He was 22 years old. He had just graduated from Berkeley. He had done a commercial. Mm -hmm. And Ro and I met him. Stephen Jang, my associate, brought him into the office. And um, Stephen said, I want to sign this guy. And Ro and I looked at him and said, OK. <laughs> you know, we, and, and I mean, it took two years. It took two years for Chris to start booking. He didn't get jobs for the first two years, but the rest is history. Um, and it and it takes that kind of commitment and the and knowing someone's talent and believing in someone's talent to put eight years into that career, which we have. Um, so, yeah, it it's not a good time. Pilot season is not a good time to be taking on new people because you really need to have the time to get to know someone to get them to get them used to going out on auditions, and, and pilot season is not that. Makes sense. Um, Jason, by the way, who was kind enough to step in, and he's a good friend of ours, um, does have to go to a, an event later this evening, so just so you know, so you don't think he's being rude, at 7 o'clock we're going to let you go, my friend. Uh, so Jason, I have a question for you. Can you give me sort of time parameters of when pilot season sort of begins and ends? Well, it's changed quite a bit because we consult for Lifetime and we just shot five pilots, but we did all ours at the end of last year. So we started shooting some late August and then we've still got one finishing up now, but that's shooting for Lifetime. And I know USA and Sci-Fi and Cable and Off Networks, we did the pilot for VH1. The single ladies is a movie last May mm. and they picked it up and greenlit it. So that's going into series starting in February. And I know most of the network pilots will start coming out now. I think I called Breakdown about something wasn't working right, and he emailed back said that MLK Day is usually, or the day after Martin Luther King Day or something is usually your busiest day of the year. That's when most all the pilot breakdowns come out, so that's when Mara and Susie are backlogged trying to get up to speed with 30 pilots out in one day and getting clients submitted, and then as the casting directors start getting a thousand phone calls that day and trying to sort through them and figure out how to get people in. Perfect. Um, that wraps up that subcategory. The next one is called getting the job, both for the actor and for the casting director. If you don't mind, I'd like to talk about it to demystify the process for us actors. Um, how does a casting director find out about a potential pilot? Anybody? <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think most of the casting directors find out about the pilots when they're offered the pilot, um, because usually, um, it, a pilot isn't something that's laying around for a long time and people are thinking about it. It's usually something that's just come off the press. Um, the network executive who's in charge of casting sometimes will recommend somebody or the director has worked with somebody or the producer has worked with somebody. So I don't think it's very easy for casting directors to really seek out pilots because by the time it's announced, it's usually got a casting director because the process is fast. I mean, the pilot comes out and as John said, you know, six weeks later, it's got to be done. And that's the whole pilot being done, not just the leads in it. So it's very quick and there's not a lot of time and, it, and it, the agents get crazy and the assistants in all the agency's offices are working till like midnight just trying to get everything out to all of the clients because they usually get like a day's notice about coming in. Um, so it, it's crazy. But uh, also on some pilots, I mean, I think John and Pam probably get them offered, but Tammy and I oftentimes, well, they'll, we have to audition. They'll send you a script and say, we want you to meet, and you'll go in, and there's three or four of your friends that coming out of the meeting going in, and you make up lists and come in and pitch your ideas, and a lot of it's about, do you interpret the script the same way the writer or the producer did? Are you sort of on the same page and kind of feel like you'd want to spend eight very intense weeks together and find some sort of agreement on what you're looking for in the pilot? So is it, is it we audition too. You bid on it, like I'll do it for ten thousand. Someone else. Said, no, mm -hmm. it's it's not true? it's usually once they've decided they want to hire you, then they sort of make your deal, and then it's up to you to agree whether you've made the deal or not. I mean, I think Susie probably makes casting director deals. I have for you know because 
we have agents make our deals a lot of times too. So if a, you're working on a pilot and that pilot gets picked up to series, does that mean that you automatically become the casting director for the series or is that a whole another ball game? If it was a great pilot experience and they want to have you back, if it was unpleasant, you're not coming back. <laughs> Or sometimes what will happen is a feature casting director will do a pilot and the agreement is only to do the pilot and if it goes to series, um, it, up front it's understood that they're not going to do it on a regular basis. Makes sense. Um, going to the talent rep side on the agents and managers, now I think we're all kind of under the assumption that for pilots oftentimes they look for the leads first and sometimes those goes to, to name recognizable actors. Do you have a harder time getting in your getting your clients seen who don't have as many credits? How does pilot season, as far as pitching new clients, go uh, compared to regular series? I think it's much easier for um, to get a client in if they're younger, especially if you're a child or a young adult. And the older you get, I found as being in this business for 22 years. The older you are, the harder it is to break through. Not to say it doesn't happen, because it does happen. It's just a lot of work to try to get someone in the door who's 30 years old without any credits. It's just really difficult. And one of the things that um, I try to take advantage of is if, if there is some kind of other experience like um, someone who's just come from New York and, and has been on Broadway and has just done a hit show, you, there, there's someone maybe who hasn't done a lot of television, hasn't done a lot of film, but there, there can be a lot of excitement about that person and of any age. Um, but an older actor um, with little experience will be very difficult, especially in pilot season. Um, but as far as, um, it, it also depends on the casting director. I mean, I think different casting directors trust different agents. And if Pam and I are talking and she says, I need X, and I'll, I'll, I will say I have John Doe, and Pam would normally say, okay, I'll see John Doe. But, it, but Pam might say to me, I need, X and I'll say to her, I don't have X. And I think that's why a lot of casting directors trust our office is we're not gonna send someone who's not right. We, we really, you know, it's not, it's not fair to the actor, it's not fair to the casting director, and it, you know, we're not gonna waste their time. So if a client calls us and says, I really have to get out on such and such because my best friend Larry is going out <laughs> on it, and Larry, Larry says I'm perfect too, it doesn't mean we're gonna get them out. Because if, if our office doesn't think they're right, and, and if the casting director explains to me why you know, this guy's not right, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say I understand and move on. Um, so, you know, as being an agent for 35 years, I kind of know what people want. The people that I've been dealing with, the casting directors I've been dealing with, I've been dealing with that long. I know their taste, I know Jeff Greenberg likes X, I know um, Dave Waite likes Y, and those are the people I know to pitch, you know. So I can't get everybody seen, I try, but I'm, I'm, I really understand who's right and who's wrong for, for parts, I think. And then sometimes I'm, I get surprised, that's really nice when that happens. Yeah. And you guys are, have a really unique vantage point because while the casting directors are busy working on their specific pilot and the breakdown they released, you guys have access to seeing all the breakdowns. Um, do you find that there's sort of a, a lot of the same description for a, a character, like you might have a client like Chris Pine who might be right for five pilots at the same time and each casting office might want him right now and it's your job to figure out a way to, to, to juggle that or are you suggesting alternate Chris Pines? <laughs> like me. Chris Pines not doing television right I now. I see seven of them here. <laughs> She's not having Did a you hear me Chris Pine for yeah. 
No, Chris, Chris Pine isn't doing television. But, um, and, and the interesting thing about Chris Pine is when, during those two years when he couldn't get a job in television or anywhere else, um, he finally got a guest role on two episodic shows. One was CSI and, and I don't remember what the other one was. Um, and he was great. I mean, knock, knock, knock out great. And th those are the last TV shows he ever did. And, and we knew then that he didn't have to do TV and it was really kind of never broached. He did a movie of the week with Diane Keaton. <laughs> I don't think he's done another TV show. I, I, he did Six Feet Under. But do you still find that uh, a lot of the casting offices might have one or more of your actors in demand at the same time, and you're trying oh, to juggle yeah, that? definitely. And you read scripts, and you decide, you know, what's, what's the one you think is going to be the one that sells, and what's the one that's going to show them off the best, and, and that's how you decide. But, um, yeah, we, you know, have people fighting over actors, and, and you just have to figure out yeah. what, what really suits them the best. John, do you mind uh, telling us, as far as casting pilots goes, what the most difficult parts of it are? Um, <clears throat> for me, it's, it's the speed. You know, um, I, uh, I, you know, you were talking about how you, you know, pi pilots come to you. Most of any pilot that I've done has come from relationships with a producer or a director or, you know, really everybody in features figured out they could make a lot of money in, in television if they had a hit. So all those producers migrated to TV and then they call and say, gee, won't you do this for me? Thrills. Um, and uh, so a lot of that comes that direction. And um, I try and, it is a part of my business, but I try and make it a part, not all of it. I really focus on features mostly. But um, uh, what was the question? See, I got. Yeah, just, you're doing right. The, yeah, what's right. so hard? Well, the what's the most difficult it? part was the speed because again, um, and, and I think, the collaborative process is different, you know. Um, in doing features, I'll sit there and talk to a producer and a director and really be an integral part of, um, of that decision making and of choosing the kind of actors that, you know, they're, they're circling around and, and deciding uh, upon. And I think in pilots, it's much more of a team of people, you know, and on some levels, in the worst case scenarios, um, don't ask me what. <laughs> um, uh, it is, you know, really casting directors are much more like schedulers than they are. And it's funny, I had a conversation with an actress, a young actress who was starting out, who said, oh really, we thought casting directors that did television were really the powerful people, and films, they had no say at all. And I said, it's, it's the exact opposite, you know, in my experience. Mm -hmm. You know, in television you have executives, you have, you know, producers, you have a team of writers, you have showrunners, you have a lot of people dictating um, what you're looking for, how you're looking for it, and who those people are. So I think, you know, you're really trying to get, in features you're trying to get six to eight people on the same page, in TV you can be trying to get 15 to 20 people on the same page, liking the same person, seeing the same thing that you do about a character, and, and doing that at top speed, for me, that's the most difficult thing. You know? Because I find it's not necessarily, in, you know, I know it, you said it, we can't take this back, but in television, <laughs> you know, it's, not, uh, it's not necessarily the best actor for the role, it's the, be the best actor you can find that day. And that's the thing that I, the, the, you know, I find difficult, uh, you know, it, it being a part of that collaborative process. It, it turns out to be much more of a product than it does art. But, you know, that is what it is. That actually brings up a, a point that I'd like to make and get your opinion on, not just about pilot season, but about the business in general. Um, from my days in television casting, I would often see that some of the people who were coming in and booking the roles were not necessarily the best actor, but the best for the part or the one who has the best relationship with the executive producer or the one who the writer sort of had in mind when they were writing it. And I'd just like to speak to the audience who are probably gonna be going out for some good co-star and recurring roles this pilot season, to how to not take that personally. Don't take it personally, people. <laughs> 
Okay. I, you know, look, I, I mean, I do find it less and less that there are shoe ins at least, again, in my experience, you know, um, uh, because studios and networks, they, they have much more, you know, they, they, they have a lot of power in who's going to get the job and who they like and who they don't and who they respond to about, you know, uh, actors for those characters. So I, I think there's less of that, like, oh, it's the producer's friend or they wrote for it. But, um, but you know, it's it's a wide variety of experiences. I'm sure you've seen other things. I'm sure Jason's seen other things. And, you know. Yeah, I think what's the most difficult is just getting everyone to agree. Yeah. You know, um, and in features, as a casting director, you have some time, and if you really believe in something, you have the time to really fight for it and try to convince people and try to show things that are going to change people's minds. The problem in doing a pilot is you don't have the time. You just don't have the time. So what ends up happening sometimes is the casting director's input isn't as important, I don't think, as it is in features. Um, and like I say, a lot of that is a lack of time, getting, as John said, 15 people to all agree on the same thing. Um, first of all, when we're all so different people, and so when you take 15 people and say, oh, we all have to agree on the same thing, it's crazy, it's very hard to do. And the people with the power in the end is usually the network um, because they're financing it. Um, it's true that studios are the power on films, but they seem to have a little more of an open ear to listening to a lot of people, especially the director of the film. And the casting director on a film works mainly with the director, so if you can get the director to be with you on what you're trying to do, you can really change a lot. And I think that's why the input on a film by a casting director seems to be more key than it can be or is allowed to be on a pilot, even though I think all casting directors would really love to have a little more time and a little more input. But when you have an actor coming into a room with 15 executives standing there, the best of actors freeze. And unfortunately, there's no going back on that. Um, what they see in the room is usually what they go on. Um, so sometimes, unfair things happen just due to the circumstances under which they're being done. Last week we had a great um, symposium here about how electronic submissions uh, has helped people who are living outside of Los Angeles and New York take part in pilot season. Um, do you find that for the major network pilots that they're allowing you guys to do searches outside of LA and New York or does it still hinder them being able to get here and get in the room? Um, I don't know. Do you want me to answer? Jason, you yeah. answer. What? I think it always helps to be in the room. Yeah. You know, it's sort of the, the, just your sheer presence sometimes doesn't you know, translate on your YouTube video you've uploaded and posted for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I think it's what Mar said earlier. It's like sometimes you do searches. You'll look outside of LA if it's a really specific character type or younger kids, but you know, I mean, for the adult period, I don't really think you ever have to search much that outside of LA because I any one of us casting directors could sit and fill up a whole day of just seeing LA actors that are exactly right for the role. Well, not exactly right, that are in the ballpark. You know? <laughs> but um, as far as being able to submit electronically, that if that's the term, I'm not I'm not that savvy, but being having actors be able to put themselves on YouTube or whatever way they do it um, has made a huge difference for us because I may have a client who's gone to New York to do a play and he's coming back, but he's not here in time to do the audition. He gets himself online and we submit it online and and. And then I get feedback, oh, he's, he's great, but I want him in the room. We'll get him in as soon as he gets back. But I mean, it's been a tremendous help. And, and I think both SAG and um, Breakdown Service have contributed to that. And, With and, EcoCast? Huh? With EcoCast, you're talking yeah, about? And, and um, doesn't SAG also have a, a facility for actors to put themselves on? Yeah, right. I right. think yeah. they do. So yeah, the yeah. Right. Yeah, which is incredible, you know, and I tell clients, you know, if I can't get somebody in, sometimes they can put themselves on tape or online, and um, we can submit it, and the casting director will look at it and say, you know what, you're right, bring them in, and it really helps. 
So I think that's been a wonderful thing for, for the agency business anyway. Cool. Um, just a, a show of hands, how many actors in the room are currently looking for representation? So a good number, which I think is probably representative of the actors at home. So I would like to ask you guys, now that we are here at pilot season, do you have any advice for those of us who are... Run the other way. Oh, uh, she doesn't mean that. that. I always say that. Don't do it. <laughs> no, but I would like to know if you have any advice for actors who do want to really get their feet in this game, uh, even though it is pilot season. Uh, what, what tips do you have? What advice do you have? It's really important to obviously be in class and network and be around other actors. Try to um, maybe have them refer you to their manager, their agent, your acting coach, if they believe in you and feel that, that you're going to work, maybe they can help refer you to agents and managers in the business. It's all at your point, if, you, if you're an up-and-coming actor and you don't have representation, it's all about networking. Um, one of the things that I tell <coughs> actors coming out of um, the drama programs is that it's really important to take control for yourself and not believe that an agent, a manager, uh, anybody, an acting coach uh, is going to be the one. You have to be the one and, and really do as much as you can yourself. And if that means um, going to one of these actors workshops where the casting directors come and see you, or if it means doing an um, equity waiver play, or whatever it is, doing your own film. I, I've signed an actor out of Fordham who did his own film. Somebody saw it, they sent it to me. It was, it was really wonderful, and we signed him. So those things happen, you know, and you can do it cheaply, and they don't have to be the most amazing um, technically. Um, but, but there are ways to do things yourself, and that's, I think, so important. Um, is this a good time to talk about the... Your tips? Absolutely. Yeah. Please. I don't know. It, it doesn't really follow, but... Nothing I said makes sense. Just oh. jump, on, jump on it. Okay. I was going to say that. So. <laughs> I, ha I had a client who... I think it's important to know how to dress. When you're, when you, if you're lucky enough to get an audition, I think it's really important to know how to dress when you go in the room. Also, to meet an agent, to meet a manager. You just need to know how to how you should look. And um, I had a client who graduated from ACT, and she went out on her first audition, and I think her clothes had all come from Goodwill, and looked like they came from Goodwill. And she, she just, it wasn't appropriate for the role, it just, she just didn't have a clue. So she had a manager, she had us, her manager and I took her out, she didn't have any money, we, we said, all you need to do is get a Brooks Brothers shirt, nice pair of jeans, and a pair of pumps, nice black mm -hmm. pumps, and you're done until you have some more money. And then you get a wrap dress so that you look, you can wear that as an executive or something. And she did, and it, and it really changed how she felt when she went on the audition. She knew what to wear, she knew that she looked clean, she looked neat, she could be anything. And um, so I, I always, we sort of have things that you should have in your wardrobe that you know you can go to, and then when you're going on an audition, you're not thinking about what you're wearing, you're thinking about the material and the character you're supposed to be, and you just do your work. So that is my recommendation. When I was thinking about doing this panel, I thought, well, you know, what can I bring to this panel? Um, and I went into Brooks Brothers and I told them about the story about my client and that this had happened and it really helped her. And I was doing this panel and would they do anything for the actors who were here? And they said that if you, and I guess they printed a little thing for you. If, if you take this little piece of paper that says you were here and you go to Brooks Brothers only in Century City, <laughs> they will give you 25% off of a Brooks Brothers shirt. 
So that's cool. So I think I think that <laughs> I think that I think it's a great thing for men to have in their wardrobe, and they <laughs> I have them. You wash them, and you don't have to iron them, and you always look clean. You always look neat, and it's a great thing. So. I'm not, I don't work for Brooks Brothers. <laughs> I swear to God, I have no stock. She's Brooks, Brooks Sisters. <laughs> but, uh, um, thank you for that. That's yeah. really cool. Uh, now, that, that's a great tip for auditioning, so I want to move into the actual auditioning process. Um, and, and Jason, I have a question for you. I have a lot of, or a, a, a few friends, actually, who have booked co-star roles on pilots and then have become recurring or series regulars once it goes into series. I know a lot of actors sort of sort of shake their head when they're going in for nurse number two. Um, but how important really is it for the actor to come in for whatever they can to be seen by you? Rephrase yeah. the question. <laughs> uh, I don't really know. Life Let's talk about auditioning. Death. What's that? Um, I just want to talk about the, you want to the talk actor's about attitude. How about Jason they, Wood tries to get a movie star to do a co-star on uh -oh. his shows. Uh, no, I don't want to talk about that. Jason, I want to talk about um, the actor's attitude and uh, an, actor be, a, an actor being excited to come in for anything because it's not limiting. Well, I, I, I think no matter what size the role is, you know, the attitude is not sort of excusing your work. Oh, I just got these sides, which to me means they're going to suck. You know, it's like the, the excuses for things to set up the table of why you're insecure, nervous, it's vulnerable to audition. We all know that. So it's like there's nobody sitting there going, ooh, I hope they're bad. This is going to be fun. You're all ro rooting for them to be really good. So you just want people to come in. And I think for me, these guys can add to it. But I think it's like having a specific choice and a take on the character that is text-based. It's not, wow, I think a British accent will make this person look interesting. It's like, it's Pacoima. Like, why is this person British? <laughs> uh, um, you know, but you'll find that, and nurse number one and nurse number two are the hardest things. You know, it's like, can you tell me about nurse number one? She's a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> nurse number two is probably around the corner if you're numbered. Do you, lo do you look like a nurse? Do you know, like, I know there are a million ways to say it's like, you know, emergency and ICU, Dr. Cooper, you know, and you'll, you can run it a hundred times, but it's like, it's just got to sound real and like it's coming out. And that's the hardest thing about co-stars is there's no jumping off point. There's no ending point. You're just passing a baton. And how do you sort of learn to do that competently and easily and feel like that all of a sudden you're not going to interrupt the show and think like, okay, it's the nurse number two show. You know, it's like... If you're the florist, my guess is there's a note on the flowers you're delivering that's moving the story along. It's not your backstory or your character line. So I understand they're the hardest things in the world to come in for because you don't really know what you're doing, but know the tone of the show and know what it is. If it's a comedy cop, it's probably room for a little joke on that one line or something lighter. If it's a drama, just say the words, it's a cop. And I know. Look I like a cop, feel like a cop. And, you know, if you're coming in for you know, a hooker, don't wear a sundress. If you're coming in for an executive, wear a Brooks Brothers shirt. 25% <laughs> off, it's in Tree <laughs> Jason, I, when I first um, became a theatrical agent, I submitted a lot on co-stars because I had to build up my client list. And I had a client who, anytime he went in on a co-star, which is harder than a guest star sometimes because you don't have, like Jason said, much to work with. Well, he would take that one line and he would like s s walk out of the room, walk back in, do like make a whole scene out of that one line and he would book every time and then he ended up booking a series, so that was good. But make the most of that one line. He would take his time and do a whole, like sometimes he took off his shirt Wiped his, wiped his forehead and said his line, and he would book it every single time. It was crazy. I'll tell you who it is. Anything like. to add, John? Um, no, uh, no, I like totally that just, agree. That makes with me a little nervous. Yeah, me too. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think she said the exact opposite, opposite. of what you just yeah. said. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, you know, those are the toughest things. I think, you know, I think the other thing um, for actors to remember is that you know, you want to be in a casting director's vocabulary. 
you know, you want to be somebody that a casting director remembers because, I mean, this goes back to the process of how we get a job and how we do our jobs and the speed of our jobs and all those things. And, um, you know, and that we want people to succeed. So, you know, if you need, you know, for uh, nurse number one and you need to show four of them, the fact is, you know, if you become in the, if you put yourself in the lexicon of casting director's vocabularies, you know, it can start out as a co-star and then it can, you can be right for a guest star. You could be right for a, a bigger role that's a co-star. You could, you know, recur. Like, it's about getting casting directors to know you, uh, I believe, you know, in a certain way, and to think of you when they think of what they're looking for because that's, that's what we do. That's the process. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Totally. I totally agree. But wouldn't you also say that you want to be the person that the casting director is comfortable having in the room and that you're not, you're not going to feel that they're going to... I mean, that, I understand your client book. Right, right, right. But right, right, right. I, I don't know if the casting director would always feel comfortable if the guy walks in and takes off his shirt. No, right. You don't want to be no. the goofy guy that yeah. comes in. Right. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, and Jason's right. I mean, you know, there are plenty of days when you go... And they just retitled the episode Nurse Number One. Right. Fantastic. <laughs> like it is it is a tough thing in that it's it's the baton passing. Yeah. It is about, you know, and I think the reality is, you know, the actors have to look at the fact you're servicing the story and you need to be part of that tapestry of the film or the movie or the pilot or whatever it is. And how do you fit into that? It's a piece of the puzzle that you need to fit into. And you know, everybody watches TV, you don't see the nurse suddenly we're picking on the nurses. You don't see the nurse come in and you know have a soliloquy in the back of the room. Like, it is a moment that serves the story and moves it forward. And, and that's where you have to find your, your place in the story. You it's know, it's like, you're there to tell it. Yeah, auditioning is storytelling. It's not yeah. showcasing. Right. That's what acting mm -hmm. is. It's like, All right, will you leave me alone? I've got it. All right. Well, no, it, there are some people that works for like Niecy Nash. Like, I first met her at a showcase. She called me up. Just on the phone, Jay Wood, yes. It's Niecy Nash, I'm pregnant, I need a job, what you got? And I'm like, <laughs> woman in diner? And she came in and you know, had the gum, she did everything, puts turbans on, but she owns everything. She's so comfortable in her skin. Usually people that are doing the motions and the props and all that stuff, they're just not trusting the material and their ability to tell the story, so they think it's like some bells and whistles and light myself on fire and you'll love me. <laughs> now in no. uh, pilots, when you are auditioning for those co-stars, do you find that you, because it's going so fast, do you have the time to see a lot of people like you do for the leads in that, or is it just like regular series? Me? Um, <clears throat> no, I don't think you have as much time. You don't. I mean, I, you know, I could be wrong, fam. But, you know, I, I mean, yeah. look, you don't want to, you know, producers for the most part are not going to sit through... 600 nurse number ones or you know for a whole day of nurse number one so no you as casting director have to bring in people that you know are the right look that can deliver and they can tell that story so for me and again you know being independent casting directors you know we all run our businesses differently we all have you know it's a very individualized thing um, but you know for me I think you know you want to get the best person in the person you know that uh, Will serve it. The serve as the role. Sorry, I'm switch you out. Sorry. Me. Yours isn't working. Oh. Plots, con <laughs> conspiracies. Um, uh, no, you want to get the best people in and in the quickest amount of time and take care of the role. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and for the reps, can you guys maybe tell tell us a story about uh, one of your clients who did book a pilot? <laughs> I know you've got a couple, Mara. I am. Yeah. We love those. Go go. I have a client that booked uh, a, a pilot, a guest star on the pilot, actually, and he ended up getting replaced because the producers didn't like him when the series got uh, made to series, when the pilot got made to series. And, you know, I'm sure that's a big crush to an actor, but then a few months later, he booked Glee, so, and it's one of the top shows on television. I had another client who booked the pilot, um, Sons of Tucson, a little boy I found in Houston. And the pilot got picked up, 
and Peter Rice didn't like him and replaced him with another actor, and I felt really bad for him, but now he's on a Disney series called Shake It Up. So you're going to go through a lot of ups and downs, and you can't take it personally. There's a lot of highs and lows in this business. When you're an agent or casting director or a manager, your feelings change from one phone call to another, depending on who's on the other line, but you just have to just keep believing in yourself and know that the right job will come along for you eventually, so. I don't have, I can't, I'm not thinking of one, but We'll come back yeah. to you. Because Jason, it's seven o'clock, so we're gonna have to let you go. Can you guys give a round of applause to Jason, please? Ada, can I get the... Thank you. Okay, now we are going to move on to questions from the audience, both in-house and at home, in the regions, tweeting and uh, Facebooking and emailing. Thank you. By the way, you guys are doing a great job, and I promise you these questions are going to be way better than mine. So, I have a question for Jason Wood, but he just left. I have a question for all of you. Um, when will casting... Oh, I'm going to skip this question. It was not very nice, actually. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to ask it. It's a question. When will casting accurately reflect society in regards to diversity on screen? No, I guess that's okay. I, I thought it was, I didn't see the diversity. I thought it was about fat people like me. <laughs> um, I think casting directors actually make great strides in trying to do that. We're really involved in diversity, especially at SAG. Um, we do speed casting here. We do so many programs for diversity, and I think all of us really feel it's important. In fact, this year, um, we were part of the Media Access Award, which I thought was great, and Robert Ulrich and his, his partners won it. And I think we're very involved in diversity, and I think we all try to do diversity all of the time when we're allowed to. Unfortunately, casting directors don't control everything, so while we can suggest something and ask for something, we unfortunately do not have the final say, especially when it comes to somebody else who's written what we're doing. Um, the writers ha really have so much say. In television, um, usually the writer is also the producer. He's also the showrunner. He has 100% of the control. And in features, while the writer, sometimes the director, and you just don't have as much control as we'd all like to have, but I think all of us, and I'm speaking for John, I'm speaking for Jason, I'm speaking for the whole CSA, I mean, we're really strong on diversity and would like to see it on the screen all the time. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's, it's absolutely true, and I think, I think, you know, the, the, the key point with, which Pam made is that, you know, we don't control the script. We don't control what somebody else writes, what a director wants to shoot. Ultimately, they are the, you know, the people that are in control of that. And um, an, an aforementioned project of mine, um, it, uh, it, it, it became a big issue in that project because we would constantly show actors of, uh, of uh, varied ethnic backgrounds and, and races and, you know, and a lot of the times it was met with, mm, no, I don't really, and you're hamstrung by that. So it, I don't really think it, you know, it lands at the casting director as much as it does of the, the creators of, of television and the executives and people that, you know, really TV in particular and film um, make those final decisions and create material. Can, could I add one thing to that? I think that um, being diverse, being ethnic has, is, is an advantage now. I, I can get someone new seen if they're ethnic where I can't get them seen if they're not. Um, I think everyone is really trying to be more diverse. I find it much, it, um, casting directors much, much more open to it and producers much more open to it and um, I, I, mean, I think it's an advantage. Now. It is. I mean, really, if you, and, you know, we can end it th with this because I don't want it to become a discussion about this, but really, if you look at those people that create the material, and, and again, in my experience, you know, television is written 
a lot by, you know, a, a, a boys club, a girls club that is very white, that is very educated, that they all know one another. And so you really got to look at where that material starts. And, and those are the people that are creating it, not casting directors going, oh no, we see the world in a certain way. I think those writers are writing about the world that they know. And, um, and until that changes in the writing world, you know, and other worlds are explored, you know, we're kind of, you know, with handcuffs yeah. on some level. That makes sense. And I, I do apologize to the author of that question. It was a good question, and I misinterpreted it when I skimmed it. So thank you, guys. Uh, this is a question from Allison to Miss Santino. Oh, no. What is the best way or tool you have used to shape your actor's careers? What is the worst thing a client or actor could do to ruin your hard work? <laughs> okay, what's part one? Part one is what is the best tool you, ha you have at your disposal to shape your actor's careers? The best tool. I guess the best tool is my experience in being in this business all my life and my relationships with a lot of the casting directors in the business and my worst Seth? Yes. What is my worst? What is your what what is an the, the worst thing an actor can do? to ruin the hard work you put into their career? The worst thing an actor can do is not be prepared when I send them on auditions, make excuses like Jason Wood um, commented on, uh, not being in class, not getting coached, unless you're totally amazing and none of my actors are totally amazing where they're gonna book every job or come close to it. And they just really need to work hard and not make excuses and be on time. I don't like it when actors call me 10 minutes before their audition and tell me they're running a half hour late. And um, what else? Oh, there's so many. <laughs> I can't take a bath. I have a Twitter question here. Uh, this is for anybody. What is the best advice you can give actors coming from another market like New Orleans that are in Los Angeles for their first pilot season? Yeah, so somebody who's, who's just come out here from another region and who wants to get involved with this pilot season but's, but's pretty new to this LA area. Well, I mean, I, you know, I've always thought that information is key you know, for actors. And I think that, you know, we live in a, in a time where the information age is really exploding. I mean, there's never been probably more access to the industry um, than there is now, that things are online and you can find out information, you can read postings, you can look for castings. And I think, you know, the more educated an actor and an actress are, the better. It can only enhance what you can, you know, network for, who you know in a project, um, you know, find, some, find it in, look at a, a, a role that you're right for. It's, I think it's information. I think it's about being aware of what's going on. You know, uh, Susie addressed it earlier about not expecting your manager or your agent to then be the keys to the kingdom. You have to be really, you know, own your career and own your own destiny in that sense and, and be active in your career. And so I think information helps that. I, um, one thing we tell actors to do is to watch television or go to movies. So if, if you know you're great at comedy, then watch the shows that you like, that you think you would be right for. Find out who the casting director is. Find out who that casting director's assistant is. Send your picture and resume to the assistant. Um, Go to one of the casting workshops, meet the assistants. They really do bring people in. I, I used to hate the workshops. I know, I think Pam feels pretty much the same way. Yeah, I'm not a, uh, I am not a proponent of I workshops. Know. And for, for a, a totally different reason. I mean, if something works for somebody, I'm for all for that. Right. But I personally, as um, John, I think, also feels, um, we really don't want to go somewhere where someone's going to pay us and to I see agree. people. I totally um, agree. I teach. Um, I teach. I actually teach a course at UCLA, which I've done for five years, which is not an auditioning class at all. I actually teach uh, a class of how to become, for actors, the CEO of yourself, 
and it's actually a 12-week course, three hours a night. So I think that tells you that there's a lot to learn, <laughs> and there's a lot that you can become empowered with yourself, because in the end, and whether you're an actor or really if you're in any business, the only way you're going to really succeed is by doing something yourself, because you can have the best agent, and you can have the best manager, and their hearts can be in the right place, but unless you really do things yourself, it's just not going to happen. It doesn't happen as a casting director. It doesn't happen in any line of business. And actors tend to get lazy and feel that they're going to walk down Hollywood Boulevard and someone's going to come up and say, hey, would you like to be in my movie? <laughs> and it just doesn't happen that way. There's a lot of work. And what hasn't come up at all about auditioning. I'm going to lower this a little bit. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. What hasn't come up at all about auditioning is I think having a good picture is really important mm -hmm. because as you're going for co-starring roles and um, the head of CBS actually said this in one of my classes is when she's going through to pick out who's going to come in for the co-star roles she's doing it in like 15 minutes so if you're coming in for nurse number one or nurse number two and you don't have a picture where you look believable as nurse number one or nurse number two she's not calling you in because she doesn't have the time to do that. And the great thing about co-starring roles is they need to find new people all the time because you can't continue on any series to reuse the same people. So when you're starting out, my best advice is to get a photograph. And when it's submitted to the casting director on the show that you want to be on, that it is reflective of what the people on the show look like. The other thing that I think is important, which Susie said about watching television, is it's really important if you're going to go in on Glee, you better know who all the regulars are. So that when you're reading and you're auditioning and someone says something to you, you know who these people are, that you're not just going in blind. And you'd be surprised how many people do not do that piece of homework. The you should always watch the show before you go in on it, always. And addi in addition to that is... Um, Every show has its own style, and there are different styles of comedy. Some of the comedies are very broad, some of them are really real, and you need to know that going into the audition so that you reflect that style. Um, same thing with the dramas, they're all different. So if, if you are aware of you know, Law and Order, and you're aware of Grey's Anatomy and what those people look like and what they sound like, you, you will go in and do a better job in the audition. Now, Kyle, who's 13 years old, would like to know, how does your advice differ for younger or teen actors? Advice? Uh, is, advice it, is it different as far when you're talking to younger kids, something they should, they should do? Do you see a, a lot of kids coming in your office who, I, I hear this a lot, are a little too Hollywood? I mean, I, I can, I, you know, I mean, I think that, um, you know, it only differs in the sense of, you know, with young talent. I think, you know, the, you, you got a lot of obstacles and a lot of advantages, you know. The advantages are is that if you're looking for somebody young, the doors open probably quicker for that as people address. Um, I think, you know, the disadvantages is that, you know, on, on, on a lot of times, you also have parents. And... Um, <laughs> And, you know, so many, so many kids can come in and have worked the material, have made choices, have rehearsed it with their parents again and again and again. And, you know, one thing a director will really look at is can you make adjustments? Can you let go of those decisions that you made? And it's a real, it's a real tell. You know, I mean, if you try and get somebody off, and even ca as casting directors just going through it, you know, if you try and get somebody off a choice and say, you know what, don't do that line this way, you know, changing, and they can't do it, it's, you know, it's, it, act, parents really, may, you know, provide a disservice to their, their children when they overwork that material, you know. And so um, I would think that's one thing that, you know, younger performers really have to worry about, you know, controlling their parents. <laughs> Sometimes I find that the younger children are better actors because they don't know how to act. And as you become an adult, you become more self-conscious. And when I read actors who are young adults or adults, they don't seem as natural as a child because they become more self-conscious in themselves. And I wanted to say if you had the time, the best experience to have in the business 
is to intern at a casting office or a talent agency or a management company because you will learn more in those few months of interning than you could for a lifetime in trying to figure this business out. Cool. We're looking for interns, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Thank you. Uh, Frank in New York asks this question. Hi, I'm facing pilot season with a new untested agent in New York. My agency has a minimal connection to Los Angeles, but has assured me they are submitting me there. Do CDs cast on both coasts as a rule? Well, I think that you cast on both coasts, but not always in person. Um, a lot of times what happens is so much is submitted electronically that you can be anywhere and ca casting director can see it. Um, it's very seldom now that we really go to New York on a pilot unless there was something strange that we were looking for because there's not enough time. Um, and usually what we would do is if we wanted a New York casting director to put people on tape, we'd probably hire someone in New York because it would be quicker and faster. And just so you know, on all the pilots, everything is electronic. Um, when it goes to the network, it's submitted electronically in the beginning. And John can, John's doing a pilot, he's doing Charlie's Angels right now, and I don't know if the system's different, but I just know on any pilot I've ever been involved with, it's always been electronic. And they make everyone upload it, all the auditions at the end of the day, and the casting executives and producers and writers all see it. And that's how it's done. So if you're in New York, it doesn't know, nowhere on the electronic submission does it say you're in LA or where you are. So it's all mixed in together. Is that how it's going on? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's Okay, uh, here's another question, and uh, Susie, I think you might be great to answer this one. Please tell us more about the contracts that actors typically sign before they test, and what a less known actor can expect to receive for the pilot, and then for each episode if it gets picked up. Really? I, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that question, because each, each situation is different. <clears throat> And um, money on pilots has gotten stranger and stranger. And um, now it used to be in the old days that when you made a pilot, you got a nice big fee, which ha paid for the pilot and held you for six months to a year. Now they pay you one episodic fee, and that holds you. And if you're lucky enough to be picked up, the pilot gets picked up and you get picked up, then you will make that same amount for each episode. Um, the money has gotten worse and worse and worse. And um, for not just the actors, but I, I know they are hurting casting people and nobody's making as much money as we used to make. Um, so I, I just don't know for a beginner what to expect. You can, I mean, Financially, I, had a, I have a kid who is on The Walking Dead, and, um, and he's Asian, and he was very lucky. He came to in pilot season, and he looks 17, and he's adorable, and he'd studied at Second City in Chicago, and we sent him, I sent him out on The Walking Dead, and he got it. The money is hideous. I mean, it's just hideous. They, they, but the cable shows are really not paying a lot of money if you're a beginner. So um, I, I don't know how to answer that. It's different for every show. It's different depending on your experience, um, how much they need you. Um, and then as far as what a contract looks like, if you're just starting out, I mean, the things that you will be dealt with are how much you'll make for the pilot, how much you'll get per episode, how, what your guarantee is, how many shows you'll do in the season, um, what your billing will be, whether you have to relocate, how much money will they pay you to do that. Um, what else? Those are the, I mean, those are kind of the basic things. Um, and. After that, I mean, an, act, an actor can't really be expected to understand these contracts 
because I can barely understand them. I mean, there are, there are terms, they send us contracts that are 26 pages long. We have to go over them in two hours and someone's testing. I, I mean, it, it's ridiculous. But the important thing is that you have somebody you trust, whether it be an agent or a manager, um, who can look them over, you trust that they're doing what can be done for you, and that you have the opportunity to get the job. Cool, thank you. Um, John, this is for you. Ricky, who's in the room, would like to know how an actor uh, might get on a cast and director's vocabulary. <laughs> Ricky, 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 Ricky. Um, <clears throat> no, I think it, look, I think it, it is about taking those opportunities of um, showing up for auditions and submitting your picture and resume and, you know, it, a lot of it has to do with, you know, if you have an agent, I mean, there is no easy answer is really the answer. You know, if you have an agent, um, it does deal, you know, Mara, I think, said this, it has to do with, you know, a lot of the business is about trust, you know, and I've worked with agents. I mean, I've never met Susie. I've known her about her my whole career. You, you work with people for years and years and years and can maybe never lay eyes on them. Um, and, but you learn to trust one another. You, you know, so much of the business is done over the phone. So much of the business is done on your word. Um, and so I think, you know, if you have an opportunity to get into the room to audition for a, a casting director, to send them a picture and resume, send them postcards. I mean, when we were doing a, a, a series, uh, uh, weekly, um, episodically, um, all the time, we, my, my staff would go through the mail and pull people that looked interesting, that they could play a cop, they could play a doctor, they could play. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to get into, uh, you know, casting director's vocabulary. It's about delivering once you're there, you know, not being, you know, um, lighting yourself on fire, you know, knowing a kind of, of professionalism and delivering the goods, you know, I think that's, I think that's it. Absolutely, that's great, thank you. Um, I have a, another question from the internet, from Erica. Um, hello, how does a good actor without representation get auditions during pilot season? I have a few guest stars, but no representation at the time. What advice would you give an actor like me? Thank you. Pam? <laughs> I was gonna say, John, what happened? <laughs> um, I think it's difficult because what happens is um, during pilot season is probably the time where casting directors have the least amount of time to meet anybody new. So you have to really be prepared ahead of time to send in your picture and your resume and try to meet the casting director. Because once you're in pilot season, there's no time. It's just like, who can we get in? Because the sessions happen fast. Like in the afternoon, they can add a character. And the next morning at 10 o'clock, you've got to have 10 people there. So that's I, what I suggest is trying to do your homework ahead of time and really targeting the casting directors that you feel you want to meet. I think that's really key. And trying to you know send them the picture, send them the resume. Another thing is, like all of you are here tonight, obviously because you wanted to meet all of us or at least have some exposure to us, which is a really good thing. You should go to as many SAG Foundation things as you can. The other thing is, it's also appropriate to write a thank you note. Um, why not? You were in the room, you saw all of us, and that's just another little thing that you can do that someone is gonna open it, someone's gonna read it, and it just puts your name there for a second. And if you continue to follow up with the people, sooner or later, John's assistant may pull your picture and say, perfect for doctor. Let's bring him in. And, that, and I think including the assistants and the associates are really, really important. Because at the end of the day, a lot of times, what happens in the last 30 seconds of the day is up to them. <laughs> because like John and I are sitting here tonight, so there are people sitting in our offices doing what we're gonna do tomorrow. So it's important to include them. Here's another question from Tony Blair here, or Tony Brown here in the room for you casting directors. What project that you've cast really touched you in a personal level that may have surprised you? Pam? <laughs> um, I probably have several of them. I, I have to say, um, my working with Robert Altman was probably um, on the films that I did with him, and I wouldn't even single out one of them. I would say in the 15 years that I worked for him, probably all of the films. 
um, touched me in some way because I thought it was so wonderful to work, you know, with someone like him. Um, other than that, I really like everything I do, to be honest. Um, I don't do anything I don't like. Um, I get to pick that. Because um, um, I don't think I've ever done anything for money, and I have children. I don't think I've ever had to do it because they were in private schools and I had to pay the bills. I think I've been lucky. Um, there's always something I find in something that touches me in a certain way, or I don't really want to be part of it. I did turn down a really big job not very long ago um, on a miniseries um, because I didn't feel that um, what they were saying was correct. And it was a big job to turn down. Um, I could have really kind of done that job. But I turned it down for personal reasons, and I've only done that twice in my life. And then it turned out that a lot of other people felt the same way about it and um, kind of agreed with me. So I think, it, I mean, I always just do what I really like, and it does have to touch me in some way. And it can be the Green Lantern and be a big DC comic commercial piece of work. But in some way, I really, I loved it. I thought it had a great message. And even though it was commercial, and maybe you wouldn't say it was artsy, it touched me. But do you I want to answer that as well. Yes, yeah. I do. <laughs> I Pam, do. Yeah. No, I agree with Pam. I mean, I think you know everything that I do. Um, I have. I ha I feel like I have to be passionate about it. Um, you know, it's too hard to fight the fights that we have to as casting directors with <coughs> agents and managers um, uh, to get talent and to talk about the script and to convince them why their clients should be in this movie and and. Uh, and, and be part of the project. And, you know, I, I really, so I feel like a, a lot of things that I've done or everything I've done, I've been e emotionally connected to and it's satisfying in one way or the other. I mean, one, you know, one thing that sticks out in my mind when I was just thinking that, I, I did a, a series for uh, HBO called If These Walls Could Talk. And, um, you know, the one that dealt with um, abortion rights, uh, you know, I later had heard that was being shown in Brazil and in South America to educate kids about, uh, you know, abortion and and the journey of that. And to think that you had a part of crafting something that then is shown in schools to open up, you know, in a very Catholic, you know, country, to open up a, di a dialogue is a phenomenal thing. I mean, it's one thing to do, you know, The Dark Knight or, or Batman Begins or Memento or any of, you know, uh, Enchanted or, you know, Zombieland, any of those movies that you feel like, oh, they're fun and I enjoy them. It's another thing when you feel like it's really out there in the world and being used in a practical, interesting way. So, I mean, I think a lot of things, uh, you know, touch me for different reasons. And we, excuse me, as representatives, have to feel the same way about our actors that we represent because we have to go to work every day and be passionate about the people we represent because we are selling them to these guys over here. And, and the way in which you are passionate about an actor is to have seen their work and to respond to that work and, and know that this is someone I can go out and and call John Papsidera, call Pam Dixon and say, this is somebody you have to see. Mm -hmm. And, and th there are that many people that you can feel that way about, but when you do, it's really exciting. Great, thank you. You guys are really, that was a, those are all great answers. <laughs> thank you. Marie, who's also in the room, would like to know if you could please describe what opportunities there may be for those with handicaps or disabilities? I used to, the agency I used to work at for 19 years, Kazarian Spencer, uh, they have a division um, for people with disabilities and who are actors. So whenever there's a breakdown, like John Levy used to call all the time for ER, they will call that agency and rec, you know, ask who they have for roles that he was looking for. I'm sure, I, th I believe they still do. Yeah, I mean, I also think a lot of, and Pam, you could address this if not, but I, I do think a lot of the creative process that happens is also a, a, a relationship and a dialogue between agents and managers and casting directors. You know, some of the best ideas I've ever had come from, you know, agents and managers. So, right. 
from, from Mara, she was said. Um, so, you know, I mean, um, so I think, you know, it is a collaborative process in that somebody will come up and, uh, with an out-of-the-box idea and say, hey, have you thought about this role in this way? Or what about this? And this is who that person is. And so it's very much a, um, a collaborative effort from everybody. And, you know, also being a casting director, everybody in the world thinks they're a casting director. You know, when you start a project, every assist assistant to every producer to every executive is like, you know who would be great for that role? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, ideas, we really filter all that stuff. Ideas come from all over the place. And I think, you know, the best of casting directors realize it's a collaborative art and it's not about my ideas, but it's about, you know, being a filter to that and taking the good stuff and, and leaving the rest behind. Yeah, I also think that everyone has to remember that we're all a part of a big team. I mean, it actors, casting directors, agents and managers are all working towards the same goal. I mean, when an actor comes in and they do a good job, it's great for me. My job's done. I get to move on. Everyone's happy. So I think people forget sometimes that we're all playing on the same team. It, we're all on the same baseball team. We really are. And we all just are working for the good of the project. Um, that's what our goal is. Our goal is to make everyone look real, everyone to look good and the director likes us, and then he comes back, and like Christopher Nolan, totally continues to hire John, and that's why, because it's worked. It's really worked, and um, I think that's what it's, what's important. Cool, good answers. Here's one from Nameless in the room. As an actor, we are always told television is how you build a resume slash career. I hate television. <laughs> what is your advice for someone to have that conversation with their agent that they want to be a film actor? Or is it just take what you get? And Hugh Laurie the Riddler? <laughs> Do I have to answer that? Um, uh, you know what? I think that, look, I, you know, I, there are days where I feel I share your sentiment. But I think the reality is, is that... Um, you know, look, it is a career, it is a, um, a, a profession, and I'm sure people going to the bank every day don't love doing what they do every day. And I think you have to look at it, it, it the same way. Look, I remind my staff that all the time. It's called work for a reason. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, it actually, you know, it's not called play, it's not called I get to enjoy my life every day. Like, it's called work, and I think that you know, the reality is, is that actors have to approach it as, as a business, you know, and, um, and we all do things that we don't, you know, I don't love taking out the trash. Like, you know what I mean? It, it, you do things, and not that you look at television in that way, but I do think, you know, actors certainly through the years have, have used theater to get commercials, have used commercials to pay for getting television, get television to get films. It is a process, you know, and certainly you can sit back and say, look, I only want to do film then that's great, but you know you're already cutting out the numbers. You know, if you, if, you, if you look at jobs in pure numbers, you know, I talk a lot about this with, with actors that move here from New York or from London or from Australia. You know, the numbers are bigger here. There's 100 jobs to get here as opposed to 10 in New York, as opposed to maybe, you know, seven in Australia. So I think it's just a numbers game. And TV provides a lot more jobs, a lot more opportunity at a quicker pace than, fil than films, by and large. May I, may I have that piece of paper, please? This one? Yes. You can read it. I wish I had a penny for every actor that I've interviewed that sat in front of me with a resume like this that sat in front of me and said, yeah, I really want to do films. I really just want to do films. And until you get to the point where you could be choosy about what you can and cannot do, you have to do television. It's so important for you to do television because all those people on television series want to do films too. And they're going to get a shot at it before someone who doesn't have a name in the business. So. I think the way the business is right now, there's as much wonderful television as there are good movies. I mean, there's, there, is, there are fabulous television shows and there are a lot of movie stars who are now doing television because of it. Um, so you can't be, you can't, you can. You can say I just wanna do movies and you won't work, basically is it. Um, you, 
I mean, you can get to a certain level as an actor and you can choose to be in one medium, but even at a certain level, that makes no sense. There are different things you accomplish through different mediums. And um, you can accomplish something on stage as an actor that you will never get to do in a movie. You can accomplish something in a movie that you'll never get to do on TV. And one thing leads to another. Um, so I, I think it would be ridiculous for anyone to say that. It, it wouldn't, it, you know, you wouldn't be taken seriously. Um, well, I had another point and I don't know what it was. But anyway, okay. If I Thank think you. of it all. Okay, yeah, come back to it anytime. Alan Gray has a question that I would like to know the answer to. Hello, how important is your IMDB page in getting a role? I think it's really important because what's that, what ends up happening so many times is we need the resume, we need it right away, just go to IMDb and print it. Um, so it's really important to have that up to date. And I think IMDb is really making a big effort to allow you to correct things faster than it used to be. It used to be two years. They once had me as an actress and a casting director. I've never been an actress, and it, it literally took me two years to get them to fix that. Um, but they're really aware of that now, and they realize how we all really rely on it because it's the fastest thing we can get at, in a second. And a lot of times we end up printing it because to email or call the agent is another five minutes. And better to have just an assistant print it. We're going into the session. Let's go. And a lot of times things get lost. Like it's in an email somewhere someone forgot to print it. And so it's important and it should definitely be updated. The other thing that's good about IMDB right now is they're verifying everything. So usually what's on it is pretty accurate at this point. But can I ask a question about that? Why would you um, not just print it from breakdown where you can see theater credits or some of the other credits. Is, it not, does, is that not as important? Well, um, I think it's just a habit. Um, I don't know. You may do it differently. Um, we use IMDb Pro constantly. We just do. Um, when I want to know something, I go right to it. It takes me two seconds. Um, we, we do rely on it quite, quite a lot. And if we do need a resume, it's because of habit. We tend to go there first. I don't know, do you work differently, John? Yeah, no, 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 I think you look at all those sources, but um, uh, I think that, you know, not always uh, are people submitted on breakdowns, you know? So, I mean, if they're not in there, you know, they're, you know, uh, you can go uh, to IMDB and, you know, if somebody's working, they usually have a, a profile there. Mm -hmm. And if you ever put your age on IMDB, it will never, ever, ever. Yeah. <laughs> you can't take That's back. True. Susie, can an actor with an agent but minimal credit still be considered for a series regular on a pilot? Yeah, it may not be the lead, but definitely, yeah. Okay. Um, you thought that was a trick question, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> David would like to know, he's in Florida, he wanted to know if you think that sending video for pilot season works. Um, I don't know if he means a video of just himself as a demo reel, or does he mean a video of, um, of a reading? I, I think if you're sending a demo reel, it works, um, so that someone can see who you are, and if you looked right, then they might send you a scene to do and have that put on video. But sure, why not? If you're in Florida, video works. I mean, I just heard a great story the other day um, from a girl that's from London whose father put her, she's 16, and her father put her school singing play audition on YouTube. And a manager, who's actually well known, decided to look through YouTubes, saw this girl, signed her. She's now starring in a pilot for Disney. So I have to say, I think video works really well, and I think that managers and agents now are really also looking at different resources to see if they can find someone. And she, she told me, she said, I was really upset at my father, and how dare he do that? Now I have to just say to him, oh, thank you so, so much. So yeah, I think, you know, in this world today, I think we all spend a lot of time on our computer. I mean, I think I spend almost my entire day on my computer, um, either reading e emails or going through things. So I think anything you can do that gets att attention is good. I mean, Justin, Bieber, um, it's all due to YouTube, you know, so there's a real opportunity out there. There really is. 
And Pam Robin here in the room would like to know if you have any tips that you can give actors for pilot season. Well, I think the biggest tip I said it was earlier really is having a good picture. A picture that looks like you, that isn't too fancy, just a real realistic shot. And also submitting yourself for something that's really possible. Um, you don't want to submit yourself for the absolute lead because the network's going to have people in mind and they're going to have those lists and they're going to go through them. But there's always going to be, especially in a dramatic pilot, there's going to be 10 people who are just going to push the story forward that have a couple of lines. And I think if you submit yourself for it, and what you can do, what's so great now, is you can go on the internet and find out who's casting everything. Um, if you wanted to find out who was casting Charlie's Angels, two seconds, you can find out it's John or stop any it, pilot. Stop it, Pam, stop, stop, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> But I think you have to use all your resources and you have to be inventive and nothing, it doesn't hurt to do anything by sending things in. If you, if you sent 100 pictures in and you got one phone call, that's one phone call more than you had yesterday so it was worth it. So you have to just look at the odds and you have to keep you know, being persistent out there because you know, people are busy during pilot season and during pilot season you may not get a call, but continue. And as these assistants keep saying this, seeing the same thing, they finally go, oh, let's just bring that person in. I don't want to see this picture anymore. And that happens. <laughs> and assistants do have those attitudes, <laughs> you know? And if an assistant wants to bring somebody in, they come in, you know? Uh, if this can go to any of you guys. What advice would you give to an actor who consistently gets down to the wire in network test scenarios, but ultimately keeps losing the part to the other guy? I, you know, that is such a subjective thing. I think it's, you know, uh, you certainly have to look at your work. You certainly have to look in a mirror, really. I mean, on some level, it's about just getting in that circle. I think there, you know, uh, we've done this, people that have done it for a while, you see a progression in people's work. You know, they become recurring. You know, they, they get a series regular. They, you know, there's a, there's a natural progression if you keep working. I think a lot of that has to do with becoming part of the vo vocabulary of casting directors and people seeing your work and, and knowing who you are. Um, but I think, you know, really if it comes down to those things, you've got to look at the work itself. And I think you got to figure out what you're doing and what, what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. And, and, and own that. Because I think it's really easy to kind of go, oh, it's luck, or it's not me, or, you know, I'm cursed, or, you know, whatever a, a myriad of reasons are. But I think, um, you know, there's a simple thing. I was in screen tests today, and, you know, there's something, you know, a real simple thing, actors, shoot themselves in the foot with. And I think a lot of young actors, you know, if you watch film, if you want, and this is mostly a film thing, but if you watch film, you know, really great stars and actors allow the film, allow a camera to see them. You know, they're not doing that much to, and, and movement has a lot to do with it. I think stillness is really interesting. I think, you know, so many actors will try and fill what they're not feeling inside and not trusting what they feel inside by movement, by, you know, doing something. And I think, you know, if you look at, you know, Julia Roberts, when she does a scene, I don't know why I picked Julia Roberts, but, you know, if, if somebody does a scene, Kate Blanchett, that she's not moving her head and she's not moving her arms and she's not, there's a stillness and a quietness that, that happens, you know, and that, that life is inside, you know, and, and a camera picks that up. And I think a lot of actors, if you allow the camera to, observe you and and uh, and leave it at that you know is, is, a, is a really simple trick and um, and hugely valuable I think in a lot of ways can I say something to that um, we had a client who tested 13 times one pilot season didn't get one of the pilots um, the next year I think she tested once or twice and booked sometimes it's really about a type it's not, about, it's not about your work. If your work wasn't good, you wouldn't be in the room. Um, and so I think you have to take that in and understand that there's so many things that come to play. And, and, but the stillness that you were talking about, one of the things Ro and Stephen and I all tell our clients is that it is so important to listen and not, 
not wait for your line, not be you know looking for what, what, when do I talk next, to really listen, to really hear. And when someone sees that on camera, that is so special. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the stillness you're talking about, and I think it's really important. Thank you. Uh, John, you just brought up uh, the screen test, so I'd like to ask a little more about that. Somebody would like to know if you could talk about the difference between a regular audition and a screen test. Um, well, it depends. I mean, now in the, you know, I, I happen to believe on some level that, you know, videotape is the actor's worst enemy, um, even though it really is an essential part. And, you know, the other side of that is we're talking about YouTube and a lot of other things. I think, you know, where it's an asset. But certainly in, in casting and just doing sessions, I think, you know, I'm constantly reminding producers and directors that this is an audition. It's not a performance. It's not a, a crafted role. It's not anything. It, it should be a library card. It should be a reference material. Oh, yeah, I remember that person. You know, um, and I think, you know, by and large, videotape of auditions have become the standard by which people get cast or not get cast. And, and I think that's a real disservice to actors, personally, um, and to the process. But that being said, the, the difference, I think, you know, is most auditions these days um, are taped. I mean, uh, uh, you know, that we'll use as a reference guide or send to somebody else, send to directors or producers or writers or networks. Um, and, you know, a screen test, there's varying degrees of it, you know, on, on uh, Dark Knight, which we just cast, uh, uh, Anne Hathaway is Catwoman. <laughs> um, uh, you know, that is, that's a full-blown process. That is, you know, um, the DP, the lighting, a set, makeup, costume, uh, Christian read with them. Like, that's a full-blown screen test, you know, in features. Um, in uh, the screen test that I was at today for Charlie's Angels, um, it's lighting, it's hair, it's makeup, it's, uh, uh, but it's shot on video, it's not film. And, um, and, uh, and it's not necessarily with the other actors, you know, the, that are in the, the piece. So uh, screen test also, you usually have a deal before you go into the screen test. There'd be a pre-negotiated deal uh, for, the most time, uh, for the most part. Um, uh, and so those are the differences. Right. Yeah, I mean, when um, Warner Brothers does screen tests a lot, um, your project, I think, is yeah. that, yeah. And on Green Lantern, we did full-blown screen tests with the DP, the makeup, everything. Um, most of the time, people want to do it on tape because it's cheaper. Um, but I agree with John. I think videotaping has done a great disservice to actors. Um, I actually have one director that actually won't even look at anything that way because he hates the pixels. It's so small, he can't see it. So he, when we work for him, we have to download every single audition to a DVD, which takes us hours and hours. But he, he won't see it any other way. And I, in a funny way, don't differ with him. <laughs> um, it's become simplistic in one way, but you miss a lot by not meeting the actor anymore. And we don't have the director directing the actor anymore. It's myself or it's John. In some cases, in some casting office, it's an assistant or an associate. So sometimes the actor's at a real disadvantage. It was really nice um, before we had all of that. And the you know you could see a lot of people and choose the top 10 to come in for the director. But now, half the time, director, I mean, on Green Lantern, I think we probably saw 600 people. He met 10. 10, 10 people. So it's a little disconcerting, <laughs> and I agree with you. Thank you, guys. Somebody by the name of 100th Monkey thinks, <laughs> thinks that you guys are great, by the way. And this is the question, and let me go to the reps for this. What is the best strategy to up one's quote? And can you talk about that subject in general? Pass. <laughs> Sometimes you really <clears throat> have to pass without losing the job in order to get more money for the actor. So and just to define a, a, a better quote, secret. a quote is going to be how much money the, an actor's worth? No, basically what I, I can answer that. A quote is, is an established price. It's, a quote is a quote for everybody. Um, if the last job you did, you made $1,000, that's your quote. And then when you get the next job, they look at your last job and say, oh, well, you made $1,000, so now I'm going to offer you $1,000. And 
this person saying, I want to up the quote, maybe I want to get $2,000. And what she's saying is you have to be prepared to totally pass. In other words, if you want to get that quote and you really think it's like you know playing poker, do you really have <laughs> the good cards? And if you do and you know you're going to get it, then you have to pass it and hope they come back to you. But I have to say, in this climate and in this financial day and age, um, when people pass, 90% of the time, everyone moves on. Um, just because the budget is the budget, and as much as they may want you, um, it's just not happening. And not very many people are upping their quotes in any business at the moment. Um, I have a casting director friend who says that actors do jobs for three reasons. Location, money, in the script. So sometimes it's about the money, sometimes it's about the script and you just have to play that role and you're gonna do it for whatever they're gonna pay you. And sometimes it's because it's shooting in Barcelona and you've already always wanted to go to Barcelona. <laughs> for those of us who are confused, what's the difference between non-exclusive and exclusive contracts for actors? Non-exclusive is you're not bound to them, and exclusive is you're committed to the project. So if you sign an agreement with like a series and it's exclusive, you can't do another series. And if you sign non-exclusive and you're booked on maybe the pilot, but they're shooting it as a presentation, so uh, as a non-exclusive, if the pilot gets picked up, you're not obligated to do it if you don't want to do it. Maybe you should talk about um, what it's like to be on Glee, how exclusive that is. That's like 16-hour days with very little turnaround time. Yeah. But, but also, oh, I, I heard it was like a 56-page contract. Oh, well, and that they, they own basically everything. own you. Sony owns, like, all the music for Glee. And then um, they own you to tour. Like, our clients who are on Glee, once the show ends, the second season, they have maybe two weeks off, and then they have to tour for a couple months. It's a lot of hard work. Those, those actors really work hard on that show, between the acting, the singing the choreography on the dancing. I told my one client I point on, I said, everything after this is going to be so easy for you. <laughs> Seriously. Great. Uh, Georgia, who's, or Georgina, who's also in the room, would like to know from John and Pam, if you could please tell us about how many leads, guest stars, and co-stars you have time to see during pilot season per show. Well, I, 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 that's, a, that's a hard question to yeah. answer. I mean, it, it, it depends. Um, you try to see as many people as you can because you want to give the everyone, you know, choices. So it's as many as you can. I don't know if I could put it down to numbers because sometimes in certain roles you kind of know who you want to go to, so you're not seeing anybody. And then in another role it's more important than another, so you're going to try to see more people, and maybe there's a role that there are, 10 ways to go and you want to bring all different people in because the great thing about casting is you're not going to bring in you know 10 of the same people I mean the whole thing is really to be creative and bring another kind of twist to something so I don't think there's a pat answer I couldn't have a pat answer on that maybe no. John could yeah no I don't I mean <clears throat> I can bring up you know Charlie's Angels I um, uh, probably read in LA you know um, about 750 girls probably for the three angels so far. We probably saw a couple, eh, maybe 100 or so in New York. Um, and then internet and videos and uh, probably another 100 or so. So, I mean, you know, you look at those numbers and, you know, it's a, it's a lot of people. You know, on um, the pilot for No Ordinary Family, which I did last year, um, you know, those numbers are considerably less. I mean, you know, we. We made an offer to Michael Chiklis. We saw, you know, uh, oh, there's a lot of series regulars. But, you know, I would say probably somewhere between 30 and 40 for each of those roles, sometimes less. Um, and, you know, so it, it depends on the length of time you have, the kind of role it is, all those things. That, um, doesn't it also depend on, like in a Charlie's Angels where it's about looks 
as as well as talent mm -hmm. that that you're more open to seeing more people because yeah. ordinarily you wouldn't see 750. No, 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 no. Right. No, it's more about really looking for you know um, being open to and looking for a lot of different kind of things. And you know, a lot of times God does not give with both hands. <laughs> Barbara Miller. Right. What? That's Barbara Miller's quote. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. I, I used to get that a lot when they would have a breakdown looking for extremely talented, you know, for a really good-looking person. And I'd say, oh, I have a really good-looking person, and they're talented. And I'd get, Mara, God doesn't give with two hands. All right, all right. <laughs> we have just about 10 minutes, so we'll do a few more questions. Um, Here's a question about auditioning. And do you prefer an actor plays to the folks in the room versus playing to the camera when coming in for an audition? I'm sorry, I miss it. But it um, I don't know. In an audition, do you think it's better for them to play to the camera or yeah. to all the people in the room? Well, if you're coming in for a television party, there are so many people in the room, it would be impossible to play to them, and you're being taped. So, which I always think it's important to play to the camera and the person and to relate to the person that's reading who's usually on the side of the camera or behind the camera because at the end of the day, what everyone's going to see after they've seen the 50 people, they're going to see the tape. And so if it's not good on the tape, they're not going to remember, unfortunately, what happened in the room. So. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to play to the person reading with you. You know, it's the only sense of reality. Um, a lot of uh, actors that you'll read, you know, beginning actors or actors that have been doing it a long time come in and look straight into the camera. It's, it's a disconcerting thing for most producers, directors, whoever's looking at it, because when you view that, you're like, why are they looking at me? Like, you know, there's a weird, there's a weird disconnect. It's not, it's not reality. It's not, it's not what you see on television. Again, it goes back to being informed about that. So, you know, if you're the only time I tell people to read to the cameras, if you're doing a newscaster or something that actually plays directly into the camera that makes sense, sure, you play it to the camera. Otherwise, you should play it to the reader. Yeah, as opposed to the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bree, who is from New York but now in LA, would like to know if you can talk a little bit more about the recasting process once a pilot has been picked up. Well, I think that goes a lot of different ways. What happens a lot of times, um, they'll pick up a pilot and they liked everyone but one person. And sometimes the original casting director does the recasting and sometimes they don't actually. Sometimes it becomes the person who's doing it as a series. And I th usually when they're recasting, they're taking it in a different direction. So usually, on most times, you are recasting a whole different character. Um, she brought up the thing about the little boy. So in that case, they had a certain reason for not liking him. And so they were probably still casting a little boy, but they were probably going to look for qualities that they did not see in that particular boy. Um, nobody likes recasting, but the thing that I've found, especially the actors who have been recast, they almost always tend to go on to something bigger and better. And while I think at the time it's so personal and you think you did something wrong, that I think most of the time it's just some executive having something in his mind that just didn't turn out the way he thought it should be. And it really is no fault to the actor. And like I say, I think last pilot season, they did a lot of recasting. And almost all of the actors then went on and got other series that were recast. And it all works out. So I think none of this is really personal because you wouldn't have gotten the pilot if you weren't good to begin with. My, Amara, that's the same for feature films, right? Because you had quite a recasting scenario with Twilight. Recasting? I mean, didn't, wasn't there that thing where they weren't sure whether they wanted Taylor Lautner at first? Oh, um, well, my bosses, uh, Lena Rocklin and Matt Luber, like really went to bat for Taylor Lautner because they wanted um, a Native American. And they just fought for him. They told um, Taylor Lautner's parents, uh, Lena Rocklin and Matt Luber, I don't care if you got to go back, like, 200 years, you better find someone that had, like you have Native American in your blood. And they just told the producers, he's Native American, he's Native American, he's Native American. And they fought to get him that job, and he got that job. So that was for the original. Whole, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, I think we will end on this question, if we can get you guys to go down the line and maybe give your advice on this. Um, Susie, what do you think is the biggest hurdle an actor faces during pilot season? Um, I would say um, letting your ego get in your way. Um, I think that it's the most important thing is to be prepared, um, take control, don't blame uh, your agent, don't blame your manager, don't, you know, the traffic. Be, be where you're supposed to be inside of yourself and in the room and you'll be fine. I had a boy test two days ago for a pilot. He's seven, 17, and it's like, like one of the biggest pilots the network is doing. And the mom said he took two shots of espresso, because it was an early morning test, before he went. And he went into his test, and he was so nervous. So don't do anything that's going to change your metabolism. And <laughs> my advice for you is get there early. So you're not stressed about traffic and just relax before a test and go over your materials and be really prepared. Yeah, I think it's about preparation. I mean, you know, um, uh, you know, beginning actors might not have this issue, but you know, actors that are out and doing audition after audition after audition, they have to remember that you know the person when you walk in that room, that is that producer, that director, that writers only focus, you know, and I think um, if you're not prepared, if you're kind of like, well, I have four auditions today and this, is, you know, they're looking for the work. They're looking for somebody to make choices. They're looking for somebody to, to, to be prepared. And, um, and I think, you know, on some, on, on some level, you can't let the process show. You know, I mean, you have to not let them see you sweat. You know, when you're in that room, you got to be focused and, and there for that project. Um, and I think, you know, being centered and, and, and prepared is probably the, the, the biggest challenge for a lot of people. I think the other thing is actors always make up their own craziness before they get to the audition. Or they walk in the room, they say, oh, everyone's so good looking, I'm never getting this part. And they make all this stuff up in their head and it affects their audition. I think the most important thing is to remember, you have a great opportunity. You get to go on that day and do what you love to do, which is act. And I think it's really important to just think about that and get rid of all the craziness because none of that's important and just say, isn't this a great thing? I get to go in and do what I really love to do and everyone's going to pay attention and everyone's going to watch it. And that's what the moment is about and I think that's the best advice I can give during pilot season. It doesn't matter who's sitting in that waiting room, it doesn't matter how many people are competing against you, it's that you get to go in and do what you do and get rid of the craziness. I think that affects the actors the most. Fantastic. Um, we're gonna wrap things up and I wanna let you guys know again in the audience and at home how proud I am of you as a fellow SAG actor um, or just regular actor in general that you guys are here, you're continuing this battle and you're doing what you love. I think that's amazing. And for the panel, Pam Dixon, John Papsadera, Mara Santino, <laughs> Susie Schwartz. You, I thought, oh wait, I thought you guys were were truly brilliant, spectacular. You gave a lot of yourselves, and you guys are so good looking. <laughs> um, we, uh, I hope that you guys continue to tune in to the uh, programs that the SAG Foundation has to offer. Please check us out at the Virtual Channel Network at www.virtualchannelnetwork.com. And a big shout out to my coworkers who supported us tonight: Otto Wolf, folk, Jenna, Pass. Thank you, Ben Freiberger. And thank you. A big thank you to Gary Marsh and Susan Marsh, the heart of Breakdown Services. Thank you, guys. You guys have a good night.